Good evening, everybody, and welcome uh, to this mini medical school uh, for the public. Session practice makes perfect using technology, simulation, and standardized patients. My name is Sandrine Van Schaik. I'm a professor in pediatrics at uh, UCSF and at Benioff Children's Hospital across town. Um, I am also the Baum Family Presidential Chair for Experiential Learning and the Education Director for the UCSF Canberra Center for Clinical Skills for simulation and clinical skills. Um, I initially suggested when I heard that, um, that this was going to happen, that we would do the session across the street in the simulation center, but I've forgotten about the cameras and the microphones, and that would have been a whole hassle. So I actually brought some stuff here to make this experiential learning for the group as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start by spending uh, some time talking about um, simulation and um, the kinds of things that we do at the simulation center. And uh, at the end of it, I'll demonstrate some stuff. And for people who are interested, they can come up front and play with some of the things that we brought across from uh, the street, uh, across the street from the center. To start with disclosures, despite the fact that uh, it says Baum Family Presidential Chair, that is an honorary title, we're very grateful to the Baum Family for supporting our center, um, but I personally have no, nothing to disclose and don't get any uh, personal gain from um, that. Um, so I'd like to start with a question for you, and you don't have to answer it out loud, but just to sort of think about it. Your experience, how did you learn the skills you use every day or if you're no longer uh, actively um, engaging in uh, work at the moment uh, that you used to use every day? And what about skills you only need on a rare occasion? And when I ask people this question and um, uh, they start thinking about that, I often get answers like, well, you know, I learned the skills on the job. Many of us learn fantastic things in schools, but they don't think that don't le learn their actual skills anywhere else but on the job. And that in healthcare is a little bit of an issue. So what I'm gonna try to do over the next hour or so is to make sure that at the end of this you understand the challenges with skill practice in health professions education and realize why simulation has become so popular as an educational strategy define simulation and identify different simulation modalities, describe the use of simulation and related educational strategies in health professions education, and list limitations and challenges associated with simulation. Now you'll note that um, the title said technology, simulation, and standardized patients. I didn't actually create that title, and in my mind these things are actually not necessarily different things, and we'll definitely talk a little bit more about other technologies, but I'm mostly really going to talk to you about experiential learning through simulation. Let's first define the problem a little bit. Practicing skills in health professions education, I started out by saying it's a little bit pro problematic to learn it on the job. There's of course only so much you can read in a book. And perfection, we all realize, comes from practice. And therefore we've uh, embraced very much this experiential learning model. And you can see this in a graphic representation on the slide. It says that you have concrete experiences, you reflect about those experiences, then you think about that some more and you create after conceptualizations about that reflection, and then you translate that in act of experimentation. That leads to a concrete experience, and you get into the cycle, and hopefully by doing that, you get better and better at the skills that you're trying to get expertise in. So I hope none of the cartoons that I put in here are too offensive to you, but um, I always this always makes me smile because for um, those of you that know uh, uh, the, this cartoonist, this is uh, Gary Larson. Um, and what you see here is uh, a group of surgeons, I assume, um, who um, something just comes out of this patient. And uh, all physicians will know that what comes shooting out of this patient is the main artery that supplies blood from the heart to the body. And then the caption says, well, watch where that thing lands, we'll probably need it. Um, and I put it in there because imagine that we all just practiced on the job. That children just said, well, I've never, I've, I've read it in a textbook, I've seen some pictures somewhere, and now I'm just going to practice surgery, and something like this happens. would be catastrophic. This doesn't happen. I, I guarantee you it doesn't happen. Um, but, but it's an exaggerated illustration of why practice on the job is problematic. And here's another one. 
Correct. And in the case of a cardiac arrest, every second counts. Who can tell me why? Anyone? Clock's ticking. Right? Learning at the bedside isn't always a very good idea. This patient needs help. We can't just start thinking about like who knows what and, and have you learned this correctly? And if not, we're going to talk about it first a little bit. So the concept of practicing, practicing and experiential learning has been studied a lot in multiple field, fields. And there is a particular person, Eric Erickson at the University of uh, Florida who, um, in Miami, who's really done tons of studies around this and come up with this concept of deliberate practice as a path to expertise. And there's five principles to it. It means that you have to push beyond a, your comfort zone. You have to work towards very well-defined specific goals. You have to focus intently on practice activities, receive and respond to high quality feedback, development a, a mental model of expertise. And what deliberate practice really says is you gotta practice, then you have to reflect on that pra practice, get feedback on what other people thought you were doing there, and then use that re feedback and that reflection to do very far targeted uh, practice to get to the next level. These pictures are of my niece. She is not as little anymore. She would be mortified. She's 11 now that I show these pictures to complete strangers, so don't tell her. But um, as you can see, she was practicing very hard on the piano and um, then looking into the camera with this, like, I've accomplished some expertise. The reason why I put these pictures in there, not just because she's a cute little girl, but because this concept of deliberate, deliberate practice has actually been studied in multiple, multiple fields, not only in medicine, actually mostly in non-medical fields. So if you um, uh, look at Eric Erickson's work, he's looked at pianists and other musicians, he's looked at sports players, he's looked at um, physicians, he's looked at all kinds of different fields and shown that if you just practice over and over again without reflection and without feedback, you don't become an expert. In order to become an expert, you need to have this concept of deliberate practice. And that's sort of shown in this cartoon representation, just practice. Over time, you develop skills, but, uh, but then um, it levels out, whereas if you practice skills through a deliberate practice model, you get better and better and better over time. There's another thing that you, you'll, if you uh, look into this literature, you will find a graphic display like this very frequently, but sometimes you actually see the left graphic represented with a slight downhill in that curve. And that's a very interesting phenomenon. And one of the most interesting studies that Eric Erickson uh, described in healthcare that demonstrates this phenomenon is done with cardiologists in community practice and their ability to correctly in identify abnormal heart sounds um, and their relationship to potential disease processes. And this is not that community practice cardiologists aren't good at what they do. I don't mean to say that at all. But what they show is that people who are in practice by themselves without any learners and without any partners are much li more likely over time to see a decline in their performance than people who um, have either learners or partners or other people in their practice. And the way it's been explained, and this to me as a physician in an academic center with a lot of learners makes a lot of sense, is that we all make cognitive errors over time. And those cognitive errors, if you don't get corrected in them, then you start to not realize that they're cognitive errors. So take the example of the cardiologist. If you listen to a heart sound and you all of a sudden make that cognitive error and you say, oh, this is coming from the left-sided heart valves instead of what it really is, the right-sided heart valves, and nobody corrects you, then now you start thinking that that error now becomes a fixed thing in your practice, and then you maintain that. Whereas if you have one of those young whippersnapper medical students they says, I thought that that kind of murmur was actually from the other side of the heart, then you say to yourself, oh, yes, I think I, I just made that cognitive error. Let me correct myself. So it's a similar principle. So a lot of deliberate practice, the literature, is very much about 
um, skills, like the sort of the procedural skills, the motor skills, um, maybe also a little bit about cognitive um, skills, like recognizing murmurs, recognizing abnormal x-rays and things like that. Um, but it's not just about those kind of skills health professions uh, need. It's also about um, uh, our communication skills. So here's another cartoon. It says, see Bernard, Julia's approach was just that tad more sensitive. Okay, so who wants another crack at the breaking the bad news? Again, it's a joke, but think about this for a moment, right? Breaking bad news to people is not an easy thing to do. For most people, that doesn't come natural. It's not a natural thing to know how to say to someone that, unfortunately, the results of a test show that you have a bad disease that we think as healthcare providers might not um, uh, result in a good prognosis. How do you use, what words do you use? How do you bring that across, right? And if you don't practice that, you won't get good at it necessarily. And I'm sure since as a healthcare provider myself, um, I do once in a while have to expose myself to other healthcare providers and I'm always amazed that um, not everybody in our fields actually is very good at, at communicating and this is one of the things that we have really identified as a gap that we can practice. So practice is really important. I think I have made that clear. Now you can practice on real patients, but what simulation is really trying to do is to say, let's pra practice on fake ones. So much better of an idea. So that sounds all very good. Let's just practice on fake patients all the time. But what you need for that is really good fake patients, right? So let's talk a little bit about what simulation really is and what, what we have, what type of fake patients we have and um, what they can do and not do. So um, I'm just showing you some pictures here and we'll go through all these different um, um, modalities, but when we talk about simulation, we typically don't talk about one thing. So everybody who thinks about simulation thinks about think it's something different. Um, and even within the health professions, when you talk to people who say, oh, you know, you work at a simulation center, you must do X, it's not necessarily the same between uh, different simulation centers. So let's talk about definitions first then. So if you just look it up on dictionary.com, it says to do or make something which looks real but is not real. Well, that is a very broad definition and not all that helpful because then actually a lot of things that we do in medical education and nursing education, etc., cetera, um, are simulation. And even, even um, uh, talking about a case, a fic fictitious case on a paper-based uh, scenario would be simulation. So there are people who research simulation as an educational strategy and they've come up with a more refined definition and say it's an educational modality with which the learner physically interacts to mimic an aspect of clinical care for the purpose of teaching or assessment. Now that becomes a little bit more defined and it's the physical interaction here, the true experiential learning that makes it um, simulation. There are people who would actually argue that this definition is not completely correct because there are virtual reality simulations, right? The kinds of simulations where you um, go to a virtual online environment and you become a avatar and you might be the nurse avatar or the doctor avatar or, and that is a simulation. And in that case, you don't actually physically interact with uh, an aspect um, um, with, with anything because it's all virtually. Um, but for the most part, people agree with this definition, plus or minus the virtual reality. So a little bit of history here. Um, one of the first applications of simulation for patient care practice was for CPR, chest compressions, resuscitation, with um, a doll named Resusci Annie. And Resusci Annie was actually a it's actually a really uh, interesting story. Um, the, the picture on the right here is a woman who was found, uh, or a young, young girl who was found uh, drowned in the Seine in, in Paris, in France. Um, and um, 
she was found and, and, and brought to the uh, city morgue and the uh, story goes that the mortician there thought she was so beautiful and so pretty and that this was such a st sad story, this young girl who had drowned and nobody came to claim her, that he made a mask out of her face. Um, and that mask of that face um, then became um, uh, part of the public domain. It was, um, um, it was uh, exhibited uh, somewhere in Paris. Um, and uh, years later, a, at the time, toy company in Norway um, decided, uh, again because the, the, the owner of the toy co company had had a very unpleasant experience with a family member with also a, a, a drowning event mm -hmm. where um, the um, uh, patient uh, was um, uh, not adequately resuscitated and just in that time resuscitation science started to become um, a real science and people started to realize that if you did chest compressions that you could actually revive something. Um, that wasn't known until the 40s, 50s uh, of the 20th century. People didn't know that chest compressions could revive uh, something. There's actually really funny stories about um, the types of people did to resuscitate people before chest compressions became en vogue, including um, bizarre techniques like blowing smoke up people's rectum, um, which was an old Dutch tradition to try to revive people. And I'm Dutch, so I find that story very funny. But chest compressions are not, it's not that um, uh, well known that that, it wasn't all that long, longly known at this time that that was a, a way to do it, but people realized, the, the company here realized that you could teach lay people to do that and that you could save lives. So he, as part of his toy company, created a line of um, mannequins resuscitating Annie. And when he was looking for a doll, like a face for resuscitating Annie, um, his, um, he came across this woman from the sand, and so this is why Rissasi and until this day looks very much like the woman from the sand. That's just a little side story. Um, but Rissasi the Annie was the first doll, and it was uh, made uh, universally available very quickly um, to teach CPR to m medical professionals, but also to increasingly for lay people. And that was um, probably in the 1970s or so. About Five, ten years after Rissasi Annie came uh, by, people started to realize that, um, that simulation could also be a very good modality for high stakes rare events. Um, and this idea came very much out of the flight industry, the airline industry, where um, pilots have to be trained for high stakes rare events, like most planes fly just fine and the instruments all work, but it is possible that an instrument falls out. And it's hard to prepare people for that, but on the job learning, right? So the f airline industry really um, led the way in very, very fancy simulators. Until this age, pilots um, get trained um, for hours and hours in a row with, on flight simulators to prepare themselves for high stakes rare events. And I'm sure you all uh, recognize this picture. It was the miracle of the Hudson with Captain Sully who had many, many years of flight experience, <coughs> never been in the kind of event that he had, um, that he encountered that particular day, but safely landed his plane that um, had an engine failure on the Hudson and um, uh, attributed that to the fact that he had learned how to do this in a simulator. Um, the picture in the right upper hand corner shows you one of the uh, first uh, airline simulators and the picture in the right lower hand corner shows you one of the first full body human simulators that was meant to really imitate a real patient. Um, and it was very fancy um, because it could have a heart rate and it could breathe and it could do all these things, um, but it um, um, broke all the time and there was only one of them. Um, and it was extremely man uh, expensive and, and resource um, intensive to maintain. Before I tell you a little bit more about mannequins and things like that, I think now probably about 20 years ago, uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, people started to realize that even things like history taken and physical exam, everyday skills that um, don't involve high stakes events, that don't involve 
patients who are dying, but everyday um, skills for health professionals education would probably also benefit from practicing using simulation. And this is where the whole movement of standardized patients came from. And that that term is evolving a little bit. We still use standardized patients. Um, other people talk about standardized actors. Other, uh, um, but the essential idea is that these people are most, for the most part, actually at, U at UCSF we use trained actors who portray patients in a very standardized way. And if you do it in a standardized way, you help students not only learn, but you can also use the actors for assessment. So a little bit more about the mannequins. So the mannequins have become very fancy, and at some point they became so fancy that they could do pretty much anything that a human um, person does except for they can't really walk and talk without intervening from uh, a technician. But um, I'll show you the, the picture at the top is a, the type of mannequin that we have at our simulation uh, center. Full body mannequins. They don't have any cords or any, any wires coming out of them. It's all wireless. Um, and uh, with just a, a push of the a button from the monitor, the, the control pad, they will start breathing. They, you can hook them up to a monitor and then they have a heart rate, they can have rhythm abnormalities, you can measure their oxygen saturation and their blood pressure, etc. All of this is of course fake. The mannequin doesn't have a blood pressure, the mannequin is not uh, having oxygen um, saturation levels. That is all being um, simulated. But it allows you to really go through clinical scenarios in a fairly precise manner. Um, and here you see how we have two pictures of how we use them in nursing education to have, have the, to teach the nurses how to recognize that things are all right on that monitor that things, and that they need to do something. And on the right hand side, a picture of team training where we get a whole team of health professional students together. So we'll go over that a little bit more. Well, one thing to say about the mannequins, they now come in all sizes um, and, and even colors. Um, and this is uh, just one set of mannequins. There's different makers, different uh, companies that uh, make them, but they come as full, um, full size adult. They come as um, children, as babies, as newborn babies, and uh, also as moms with babies um, that can uh, simulate a whole birthing process. So then we also do a lot of simulation with body parts. And I remember when we first opened our uh, simulation center across the street in uh, January uh, 2011, um, that we had a whole lot of these arms um, laying out because we were, had just unpacked everything and we were, gonna, we were getting ready for our um, opening day and there was an electrician coming through the center to make sure that everything was actually uh, working and he was quite taken aback by all these body parts and he was like this is a little bit of a creepy place here and we're like it's okay it's all plastic it really is all plastic so the body parts are really used to teach specific procedures in the um, left upper hand corner you see um, a uh, student practicing what we call intubation of the trachea, which is putting a breathing, breathing tube down the patient's throat so that the patient doesn't have to breathe on his own anymore. We can hook it up to an oxygen machine that will do the breathing for the patient. Right upper hand corner, that's actually an ultrasound machine. This is one of the more newer modalities that we have. Ultrasound is used more and more as a, um, as a um, technology to look inside a patient and to, for example, locate a big vessel where you might want to put a line in to give patients medications and fluids that they need. Um, and now we have mannequins that have the same visual um, representation on the ultrasound machine as real people have, but then you can practice um, with needles and lines and all that stuff um, on a, a model rather than on a real patient. The um, left lower corner is, uh, are the IV arms, that's how people learn how to place IV lines um, before they actually start feeling around in real patients and say, oh, your veins are rolling a lot. Um, so this is a place for them to get started and get some skills. And then uh, the right bottom uh, corner is uh, our trainers for, um, again, central lines, so big IV lines and for uh, spinal taps. 
and we have lots and lots of different ones in, a, in addition to these, but these are probably the most common one, uh, commonly used. And again, these also come in different sizes, so we have baby sizes and children sizes, etc. A little bit more about uh, the actors. Um, so they are trained to portray patients, but they're also trained to give feedback as if they were a patient. And that is probably one of the more powerful parts of this whole exercise with actors. So it's not just that they um, sit there and answer questions when the student doctor or the student nurse asks um, how they're doing and where their pain is from, etc. But they also, at the end of that exercise, will tell the student how it felt to be the patient and what they thought the student did well and what, this, that what they thought the student could work on. And that's a very, very powerful learning modality. So I've shown you a lot of different things. And the question is now, what, what, what should you use for what? So there's different types of simulation that can be used for different educational objectives. Here are some of the skills that health professionals need to learn over the course of their training. So history taking is an enormously important one, right? Um, and you know, this may seem strange, but we actually did, did a fun um, um, exercise with some people who are not from a medical background at all um, for a fun event that we had. And we said, why don't we um, ask people who haven't done this to take a history of a standardized patient, of an actor. And um, it was clear that, they, that people were like, wow, yeah, I'd never really thought about that. But I don't really know what questions to ask. The patient came in with a complaint of chest pain. So that sounds bad. And now what, right? What questions do I need to ask? And imagine a student who is sitting there and thinking to themselves, OK, so chest pain. I have just learned in class that chest can be, be A, B, C, D, E, F, all these different diagnoses. But now how do I ask the right questions to figure all of that out, right? Um, so history taking um, and associated communication skills because you can take a history, but if you don't actually pay attention on how the person across from you responds to the questions that you're asking, don't pick up on subtle cues, don't realize that some questions might sound offensive or maybe the make, make the patient scared or make the patient not want to answer the question. That's a big part of doing a good history. And then combining that with the knowledge that you've learned as a learner about the medical content, that's what we call clinical reasoning. Because if you come in as a patient and you come in with headache, right, and the student goes through an endless list of questions of which 90% you're thinking to yourself, why on earth are you asking me if I have pets at home? Because I have a headache. I don't think my pets are causing headache. And the medical student says, well, you know, those are just all the questions that I'm thinking about, right? We have a problem. So that idea is clinical reasoning. Like what kind of questions, when I hear headache in a person of this age with this overall um, health uh, status, what are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about, and how do I ask the right questions to get there? That's the concept of clinical reasoning. Clinical exam skills are also um, uh, skills that, that health professionals all need to learn. And then teamwork, how to work well in a team. That also might seem very um, sort of like, well, duh. And, don't we all just learn that from being in school or in sports or whatever? But it's a little different in healthcare because you actually need to understand what the different professions can and cannot do and what your responsibilities are and how you communicate clearly in the team. So that's another real big one. Resuscitation skills, we mentioned that already, and then procedural skills. So those are all the skills. Now, standardized patients are very good for history taking communication skills and to a certain degree for clinical reasoning and also for clinical exam skills. But remember that most of our standardized patients are actors in the community and hopefully they're all in good health. So you can teach people this is what healthy lungs sounds like, this is how a normal heart sounds like, but you can't really use them for abnormal. So there's limitations there. Mannequins can be used for clinical reasoning, for clinical exam skills. They can, um, they can mimic a lot of abnormal exam um, findings, um, and certainly also for 
teamwork skills because you can have a whole group of people be around a mannequin and practice teamwork. The clinical exam skills, again, are not fantastic because the mannequins, they're still plastic, right? They're not, they're not, you can't actually, a lot of the finer touch and, and visual stuff is not, you can't uh, mimic that on a mannequin. Um, and I always get um, a little worked up about this because these mannequins are, mannequins are incredibly expensive and then I put my stethoscope on them to listen to their lungs and I'm like I still hear mostly creaky so sounds that come from the mechanics and not from the uh, lung sounds that I'm supposed to um, hear. So it's, it's, it's hard to do that really well, there are limitations. And then the third thing, the task trainers, those body parts that I showed you earlier on, we call those task trainers, they are very good for resuscitation skills and for procedural skills. And then the last thing I have to tell you is this thing called hybrid simulation, where it, different kinds of modalities are actually combined. And so I'll give you an example here, and actually one of the things that I brought for you to demo um, is this as well. So this is a, a, an actor who is portraying a woman who is giving birth. The baby is not a real baby, it's a plastic baby. And um, this is an, a precursor of what we have now, a model called Mama, Na Mama Natalie, which is really a fake uterus with a fake baby that the actor can strap on and then from the top push out the baby as the um, midwife or the physician or whoever is practicing the skills. And what this adds to just having the mannequin that I showed you earlier on that also can deliver babies, the mannequin doesn't move much. She can breathe, but that's about it. The mannequin doesn't scream. The mannequin doesn't say, I'm not doing it anymore. I can't push anymore. All these things a mannequin can do, but the actor can. Another, oh, so this is Mama Natalie, and we have one if you later on want to see it. So it's a, it's a fake uterus, and this is the baby's head that you see uh, coming out of there at the bottom. On the right-hand side of the slide, um, you see what probably for you looks like a, a patient and um, a, uh, a person who is suturing a wound on her shoulder. But that's not her shoulder. That is a pad that she's wearing on her shoulder that is made out of foam um, that is, is meant to practice suturing on. Now you can also practice suturing on the pad and just put it on the table and that doesn't move and that doesn't scream and that doesn't say you're hurting me and that doesn't do anything that makes that task harder. But this uh, actor actually can, so it's another form of hybrid simulation. So we use simulation a lot and not just for learners, um, we use it from admission to post-graduation. So the kinds of things, and I'll talk about some of these in a little bit more detail, we do medical, mini medical interviews with actors, I talk to you about history and physical exam, we do procedures from very basic things like IVs to very advanced things like uh, robotic surgeries. Uh, clinical reasoning and management, CPR and advanced life support training, crisis management and teamwork, but also difficult conversations, how to apply ethical principles, all those kind of things we teach in our simulation curriculum. So admission interviews, this is something that uh, is becoming more and more popular, the mini medical interview. It's a brief simulation exercise typically with actors, standardized patients, can have multiple stations in um, uh, sometimes case scenarios, and it's typically focused around ethical decision making and communication skills. So again, um, and I always feel terrible for these poor applicants to medical school and pharmacy school, they're already so nervous and they've gone through all of this and they, they come for their interview and they're actually being uh, put in an observed situation with an actor who portrays a patient and almost always an ethical uh, problem, something that is difficult to solve. And that's part of the admissions process. It um, has been studied and the predictive validity of the multiple mini interview for selecting medical trainees turns out to be actually pretty reasonable, meaning that if you look at um, how, they, how people did at this mini medical interview and then look later on how they did in clerkships, there's a good correlation there. But it's a resource intensive um, strategy for admission selection. History taken in physical exam. 
Um, I already told you some about this. I just wanted to make sure that you knew that you know those abnormal um, uh, findings. I told you the mannequins aren't great, and the standardized patients tend to have only normal um, uh, physical exam findings. So we're increasingly getting just partial trainers. So this is an auscultation mannequin. He doesn't do anything else. He doesn't move, he doesn't breathe, he doesn't do anything. It's not even a whole body. Um, but he does have all kinds of different lung and heart sounds programmed into it, which the student can listen to through a stethoscope. But then we can also play it on um, speakers, so that if a student says, I don't hear it, you can play it out loud and you can actually really try it and there's graphic, there's a computer with a graphic display so you can say, look at this display, this is the piece of sound that you're uh, listening for and that has really helped uh, students. I remember when I was a student way back when in the, in the Netherlands, we would go from bedside to bedside and the professors were like, listen to the, listen right here to this patient heart, do you hear that murmur? And I would be like, you know, and after a few times you just said yes, but you meant no, um, because you still didn't quite get it, right? Um, and I remember that at some point to be like, oh, now I heard it, but it was like the fifth or the sixth time that someone actually made me listen that I finally heard it. So it's a much more efficient way of uh, teaching people those kind of skills. So procedure skills, I told you about that a little bit already. Uh, you've seen this picture before about the breathing tube being placed. And I mentioned that we use it for placing IVs. We even have uh, fake blood in that picture on the right upper corner. Um, but also just very basic skills, right? So uh, the left upper uh, uh, corner picture is a, a group of nursing students. They're all very young women who do not, um, for the most part, do not have children themselves. They have never held a baby before. And they need to learn how to do very basic things with infants. Suctioning out the nose, swaddling the baby. So we have 12 essentially just dolls in the Sim Center to have all the nursing students practice those kind of basic skills. And then clinical reasoning and management. Um, uh, the clinical reasoning um, can certainly be done um, during the history taking physical exam um, skills, but a lot of clinical reasoning actually happens at the bedside. And I remember at the very beginning, I showed you that cartoon of the, um, of the physician with a group of learners at the bedside of the patient who really didn't look so well and said, so, you know, who knows what we should be doing right now and everybody's just standing there and he says the clock is ticking, right? So in a lot of these scenarios where the clock is ticking, you can actually, in simulation, stop the clock. And that's exactly what the teacher on the right-hand corner has done. She's, everybody is trying to, all her students are trying to do something with this patient who you may not be able to see, but there's a number on the screen that it says 77 and healthy patients says 99 or 100. When I see that, I always get a little nervous. I'm like, is anybody doing something about that? This patient has low oxygen levels, right? And they're not really f sure what they need to do about this because they're sort of thinking to themselves, we know this is abnormal, but we're not quite sure what's going on and we need to have that clinical reasoning figured out how to do it. So she stops the clock. Because the mannequin doesn't care. The mannequin is the mannequin. She stops the clock and she starts writing on our beautiful covers that are actually made out of dry erase. She's not just writing on the wall against any rules, but they're made out of dry erase materials. And she starts writing out, here's what you need to be thinking about, right? And that's a very powerful uh, learning tool. And then later on, everybody sits around and says, okay, help me understand this a little bit more and has opportunities to ask questions. Things that, you know, if you were a patient and you weren't feeling well and the professor was doing that with their students at your bedside, you would be like, hello, can we move on? You know, I, I don't, I appreciate that you need to learn. So this is a much, much better way to learn that type of skill. And then CPR and advanced life support skills. And I brought one of our life support uh, skill trainers that I will so show you a little bit. Um, but they have actually become a lot more fancy since CPR Annie, because CPR Annie was, or Resuscy Annie was just a doll and you could press on her chest and that was it. Um, the, this is the newest generation of Resuscy Annie. I think she still has the same face actually. But now there's a little device with it and you can actually see whether you're going fast enough, whether you're going deep enough, whether you're uh, letting it uh, release enough, so whether you actually do high quality CPR. And we've seen that since we're using these, the overall quality of CPR and how well people retain that is much, much better. 
and then I mentioned uh, teamwork. Um, it's it's it always surprises people um, when you see a group of you know you've you've um, you've I'm sure watched a TV series where something happens in a in a in a hospital and everybody comes running and you know and starts doing interventions well how do these people really know who's going to do what how do they communicate etc it's not quite like on tv for the most part but um, we do actually train our um, students on how to do that and we practice things like so the doctor might say i need a dose of drug a right um, but it's chaos has the nurse really heard that 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 it's the right drug, is it the right dose? So we practice things like closed loop communication. Drug A, I'm, or, I'm, I'm getting it right now. Drug A, I'm giving it right now. This is the dose that I'm giving, closed loop communication. So those are the kinds of things that we practice with our teamwork training. And then there's much more. We do difficult conversations. I am uh, also the, the training director for our pediatric critical care fellowship program. So these are pediatricians who go on to, uh, uh, to specialize as intensive care physicians, which is my field. Um, and that's a field where we have to uh, have difficult conversations with families sometimes because we do a lot of fantastic work um, um, making children better, but we can't always do it. And that's a really hard thing to do, to tell a family that their child is not going to survive. So the trainees come to the Sim Center, we have actors that get trained on portraying these families that are heartbreaking, everybody's crying the whole afternoon long when we do these, but they learn an enormous amount uh, from it and they learn what you, words to use, what words, what how much silence is actually okay. A lot of people in the health professions have trouble with silence in conversations and we tell them it's okay. So we really teach them how to do that well. Um, these pictures actually, our sim center looks very uh, high tech for the most part, it looks like an operating room or an emergency center, but once in a while it converts into a rural village uh, from sub-Saharan Africa. And we do our um, ethics training for um, global health um, in the Sim Center, again with um, actors, and we go over scenarios of like, well, how, how, what do you do with uh, a, a woman in, in a low resource uh, center who is, um, um, her, her, I think the scenario is her husband is at work in the fields, um, won't be back for three or four days, and you think that um, she really, the only way to save her baby is a cesarean section, but she doesn't want to come with you because she doesn't have permission from her, um, from her husband. So how do you deal with that? How do you communicate? How do you uh, um, think about these cross-cultural communications? So we do a lot of really interesting and different things beyond sort of the standard stuff. So as I mentioned, the, the, the title um, of the talk mentioned technology and simulation, the part of simulation that doesn't use actors is of course a lot of technology. Even the part that uses actors because of some of the um, AV recording materials and the software that we have uh, uses technology. But there is definitely a lot more other technology that doesn't really fit um, under simulation um, that we're utilizing at the, at the center but also outside of the center. And I just put that up as a few um, pictures to show you the kinds of things that we're doing. So, um, as I mentioned, a lot of physical exam findings cannot be demonstrated or taught um, with, with actors because they are healthy and the limitations of our task trainers and our full body mannequins um, are there. There is not, not something for every single abnormal physical exam finding. So, okay, so then real patients, how do you expose large groups of students to real patients without driving the real patients crazy? So. Um, our telemedicine education program helps with that. So here is a physician, an attending physician, uh, examining a patient who has a neuromuscular disorder that makes his uh, reflexes abnormal and he, that's being broadcasted directly to a classroom and you can just see it in the little insert there. It's a classroom with students there who have a direct audio and video feed and they can then ask questions and they can have a communication with the uh, patient and the, and the physician without the patient feeling that there's like a hundred medical students sitting in the exam room um, with him. Um, 
picture on the right um, uh, upper corner is from our anatomy lab. Um, and it didn't, qu you can't quite see it, but in our anatomy lab, we're starting to do a few things. First of all, um, uh, there's, um, there is uh, skeletons and cadavers and then uh, iPads with a lot of um, the content information so that they can compare the textbook pictures with what they have in front of them. Um, even, and also textbook pictures of, uh, of a uh, leg with muscles on it with the skeleton picture and sort of figure out how that uh, fits together. And increasingly, we're using virtual reality. Um, and where we're, um, the glasses are still kind of big and clunky, but where someone can actually look at their hand and the virtual reality overlays whatever structures you decide to display there, whether it's the bones, the vessels, the muscles, etc. So that's increasingly how people start to learn um, anatomy. And that's um, 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 rapidly, rapidly being integrated uh, here in the School of Medicine. Uh, and uh, physical therapy. So it's time to talk a little bit about the limitations because, you know, I sometimes feel like I'm a salesperson even though I don't make any money out of any of this. I just um, get people to come and help them develop their programs. Um, but there are limitations to um, simulation and probably the most important part of it is that it is simulated and it's not real. So. In simulation, we use this word fidelity, and fidelity is to the degree to which it really represents reality. Um, and that probably is a little bit overrated. The companies that make the mannequins put a lot of effort into making it all look all that real, but we increasingly start to realize that the, the, what, how realistic the equipment looks is, is not all that important for all kinds of simulation. Because there's also how realistic the environment looks in which it takes place. You can put a simulated mannequin in the classroom and you're never going to feel that you're in a hospital. And what we call psychological fidelity, which is how real it feels that you are responsible for saving this patient's life. And to illustrate that piece, um, I can have a teddy bear and I can tell a student, oh my God, this is, this is my child, you need to do something. Are you, are you gonna resuscitate this patient? And most students, if I keep that up for a while, they're gonna be a little nervous and they're gonna say, um, yes, well, I know CPR, I'm gonna do CPR, and they're gonna do CPR. And they're gonna feel that they were the person responsible for saving a teddy bear's life. You don't need a fancy mannequin for that. That's the concept of psych psychological fidelity. Right? It's easier to reach psychological fidelity if you have a mannequin or an actor or something that looks as real as possible. But you don't need psychological fidelity for every single skill that you um, learn um, in medicine. And I actually have brought the, this piece of equipment with me that is being portrayed here. It's actually this box. So this is a laparoscopic trainer. Now, nothing that you see on this picture and nothing that you will see in this box later when you come up here looks anywhere close to a body part. It really doesn't. Nothing inside you looks like this, I promise you. It doesn't, right? But what you would learn from doing this is eye-hand coordination. Because what you'll see later on is that you're actually going to look with one thing whether you operate a camera to see something on the screen, and then you have these two things that you can manipulate to move these different plastic thingies from one peg to another peg, um, and you have to learn a hand-eye coordination. So they've done studies where they've taken first-year medical students and had them practice with one of these um, just until they had good eye-hand eye coordination. And then they brought them to a lab and had um, them do gallbladder removal laparoscopically, so with the same instruments, in rats. And they also got the first year surgery residents to do the same things, people who had been trained in actual laparoscopy. And the medical students did way better than the surgical residents on this because they had already practiced all these skills. So this is just to say, it doesn't always have to look like a real thing to do the trick that you want to do in terms of skills training. 
Another lim limitation is that we don't know for everything, but it actually translates to clinical practice if you're good at something in simulation. And this is known as, uh, this curve is known as the uh, 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 Dunning-Kruger effect, or the Kruger-Dunning effect, I always forget which person comes first. But it basically says that if you don't know anything, then you tend to be very, then you tend to lack confidence. Right? But a very well described phenomenon is that if you start to develop some experience, so you go down the, um, the x-axis, that you um, start to rapidly gain confidence. You go like, cool, I know how to do this, I can do that, right? But you gain confidence a lot faster than you gain competence. So, and I see this all the time in our trainees. The first years, they're scared. They're like, oh, I don't know anything, I'm scared, I'm not gonna do anything. The second years, they're like, Pfft. Let me do it, leave me alone, I know how to do this. And you look at them and you go, mm, you don't. And then the third years actually come back up and their experience is more, their confidence is starting to grow more, but it actually never gets to that high confidence that's in the beginning, right? And so what we sometimes worry about with simulation is do we create too many people who are at that peak part of the curve earlier on? They have learned enough to be confident, but not enough to be competent and thereby are potentially dangerous, right? And so we're really trying to make sure that this actually translates to actual practice and, and, and making sure that we keep tabs on that. There is some evidence in the literature, um, and I'll show you just some titles of papers that have been published about that. So, Simulation-based education improves quality of care during cardiac arrest team responses in the academic teaching hospital. This was done at Northwestern, where they've done a lot of this type of research. Um, and they actually showed that if you practice with team responses to arrest situations with mannequins, that in an actual practice, people respond uh, quicker and follow algorithms for resuscitations better. And another one um, is the use of simulation-based education to reduce catheter-related bloodstream infections. So uh, central line catheters are big IVs that are being placed a lot in uh, intensive care units or in cancer units to give medications and fluids and other um, things that are needed for patients to be given into the bloodstream directly. And as the biggest complication is that they can, you can get a bloodstream infection as a result of these. We know that some of that is related to um, good placement, and so if you train people with simulation, you reduce the number of infections. And then the last uh, limitation is resource intensive. It takes time, people, equipment, space. And so one of the things that we really talk about a lot uh, on a regular basis is how do we do this most effective and efficiently. Um, also, it's if you have uh, 150, 60 medical students, and I can't remember how many nursing students we have, but big groups of students, and you try to get them all through simulation experiences, and everybody has to pretend to be the one person who's the active learner there, then you know that's, that's a hard thing to do. So can you actually learn from watching others, and what kind of strategies can you put into place to make that most effectively? And then, as I mentioned again, what equipment helps achieve the best learning for what purposes? So can you do some things with a teddy bear, and for what, for what things do you need the really fancy mannequins? So in the last few minutes of talking, before I'll demonstrate some stuff, I want to tell you a little bit about our simulation center across the street. Um, so it's, it's called the UCSF Canberra Center for Simulation and Clinical Skills, uh, named after uh, Maurice Canberra, who helped us with the startup funds um, um, to get this opened, uh, as I mentioned, uh, back in 2011. It's a, it's a beautiful space. It has uh, two large simulation rooms that can be configured in all kinds of different ways uh, as operating rooms, as an emergency department, um, as a multi-bay um, ICU um, um, uh, with all the equipments and mannequins that, um, to make that happen. Um, the, it's outfitted with fantastic AV recording um, and playback um, uh, equipment um, and the playback equipment um, includes so to just orient you here 
these are the camera views and then also the monitor view so that when you look back with a group of learners you can actually tell them you can say well you know here so at the beginning of the scenario this is what you were doing and this is what the mannequin's monitor looked like and had you actually recognized that x y or z was going on and at the bottom and i'm sorry that this picture is a little dark is um, one of our instructors who is actually doing exactly that she is playing this back of one of our um, uh, debriefing rooms She's playing it back on what we call an electronic whiteboard, which she can actually write on and she can uh, impose over the, over the images. She can impose uh, formulas to explain to people why certain things are happening with the heart and the lungs, etc. And so it's a very powerful teaching strategy. In addition to two large simulation rooms that we use mostly for mannequin-based simulation, we have 12 exam rooms that look like uh, this. Um, and um, they have exam tables that can be configured to be in a, a dentistry table, a regular a patient room table, a, a OBGYN table, so that all the different learners can um, use them. And then we have a very large pool of actors, about 150 to 200 active uh, standardized patients. Most of them are professional actors, and for, this, for them this is a, a source of supplemental income. For many it's more than just a side job, there's many that come and do a lot with us and they really love making this contribution to health professions education. There are region, regional and national organizations for standardized patients. Um, there's a whole core curriculum published um, uh, online by one of the organizations. It's really a very active uh, community and every year we celebrate with the community all the fantastic work that we do. Now, to give you a little bit of a sense of um, how many people come, it's a 4,000 square foot space, 12 exam rooms, two um, simulation rooms, uh, each with a debriefing room and, a, and an orientation classroom, which is probably one-sixth of the size of, of this, one-fifth of the size of this. When we first opened, we saw about eight to 9,000 learners per year. <coughs> now, we don't have 9,000 individual learners at UCSF. We have a lot of people, but not that many. But um, a medical student that comes uh, four times in his uh, first rotation gets counted four times. So these are learner um, uh, entrances, so to speak. So initially around eight to 9,000. And uh, the last academic year we were um, pretty much double that, 16,000, almost 17,000. Where do they come from? The majority come from the School of Medicine. The School of Medicine has both medical students, undergraduate learners, and then what we call graduate learners, so resident physicians who have decided to uh, specialize in a specialty. They get most of their learning actually in hospitals and clinics, but they come to the simulation center to uh, do their orientations and then to augment their learning in the clinical sites. A good chunk comes from the School of Nursing, uh, as, and, and then uh, the School of Pharmacy, the School of Dentistry, um, and that sort of is representative of the sizes of the schools, actually. It's not just that they come less, but they're also smaller size schools. And then IPE stands for Interprofessional <laughs> Education, which is where groups of learners from the different schools come together and learn at a very early stage to work in teams. And then the other is all kinds of other fun stuff that we do. There's a little bit med center staff, so people who work for the hospital. They're not part of the schools. They work for the hospital, established nurses and physicians. But we also do a ton of um, outreach activities and tours for people um, and other fun things. So when we started, um, if you looked at the calendar, you would see that about half of the time we had activities going on. And as my job as the education director, I would go out to schools and programs and departments and say, you know, simulation is such a great strategy, so you would see really come. As you can see, that has paid off. I think it's also just word by mouth. People start to realize this, and simulation is increasingly recognized nationally by accreditation boards and things like that as a powerful strategy. So we're now at 91%. And that's average utilization rate. And what it really means is that there's times of the year that are actually above that, and people work late and come in early, and we try to do some things in classroom, even though that doesn't really work um, all that well. And I'm currently lobbying very hard to see if we can get a satellite simulation um, center at our Mission Bay campus to decompress this a little bit. But as you 
probably all know, because I'm sure you all know San Francisco very well, space doesn't come at a low premium here. We have some affiliated programs. Um, the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital Mock Code Program, which is really a team training program, which is something I started uh, back when I first came on faculty in 2006. Um, it's in every unit in the children's hospital, at least uh, once every two months, in most units once a month. We get the team together, we get one of our uh, baby or uh, child mannequins, and we practice what would happen if there was an emergency with the whole team uh, together. We do more than 60 sessions uh, per year. It's really how to not just focus on the learners, but also on the staff that do this on a daily basis, but might not um, interact with emergencies very frequently. And then I mentioned outreach. So this is our summer intern program. We get uh, high school students. They come and spend the summer, and they basically help us clean up the mess from the year. And they love it. They uh, come to the center, and they get to like fix the mannequins and organize our supplies. And in return, we make them all uh, give them all CPR training with a certificate at the end of it. And it's always a really fun time in our center. Um, so we have a lot of connections with the community. Uh, we, uh, within UCSF, we really try to create a community through faculty development. Uh, we have a simulation fellowship uh, that brings a lot of learners together. We do a fair amount of research. We have connections with other simulation centers. Uh, we started a consortium with other University of California um, uh, you know, campuses that have a simulation center and we are a member of the California Simulation Alliance which is mostly nursing simulation focus um, and then uh, with the community we are a American Heart Association CPR training um, site uh, we do at the Canbar Center at our site here mostly training of health professions and health professional learners but at the uh, we affiliate with the UCSF uh, Police Department uh, down at Mission Bay and they do a lot of community training uh, for uh, CPR. And then I mentioned the summer intern program. We also get a ton of high school students uh, on tours and they get to play with the mannequins and see what it's all like as well. All right, summary. Simulation refers to a variety of educational strategies to help learners in the health professions acquire patient care skill. It's a powerful strategy to allow for repeated practice, feedback, gradual increase in mastery and expertise. It allows for exposure and experience with low frequency, high stakes events. And it's safe for patients, but it's also safe for learners. And I actually didn't really spend a lot of time talking about this, but I tried to weave that in a little bit. For the learners, it's no joke either to make a mistake with a real patient. There's very few people out there who make a mistake and walk out and say, oh well, you know, that happens. Like I, I have experienced it myself. I've seen other people go through it. If you do something that you recognize was a mistake or was you just, I don't know what you weren't thinking or you just, just in, a, in a quick moment did the wrong thing, you feel terrible. And what a relief to realize that the patient has an on-off button that you can turn on again and you can practice it again and it hasn't harmed anybody. So it's not just for the patients, it's also for the learners. And then lastly, it can prepare for, but it can't really replace real life practice. And with that, I want to open it for questions. I'm just going to look at Isaac whether we should do the demo first or questions first. Demo first. Let's do the demo first. OK. So I'm going to start with this guy over here. So this or girl um, uh, is the newest Resusi Annie. Um, and Stacy Hughes, one of our fantastic Canberra staff, she's going to help me with this. Um, so as I mentioned, it's still just a CPR mannequin. Microphone, I'm sorry about that. I make it improvise. I wasn't supposed to demo, but you know, it's an experiential learning, so I have to show you how it works. Um, so. It has this little gadget associated with it, and I'm not sure if you can totally see it, but there's these two yellow lights here. Now, if I start doing chest compressions, you see how the lights are changing. So if I do it with the right depth, that gets green. Uh, sorry, if the top here green means that I'm doing it with the right release. If I would do it with the right depth, it would also be green at the bottom. 
right? Which is really hard to do from the position that I'm standing. Yes, you, you are, yes, and you can, can keep experience. talking. You can experience. And then the radio, you show us, but try to not block the camera too much. There you go. They usually get on the gurney if they're in the hospital, actually. There she goes. She knows how to do this. So there we go. Oh, we have two green lights. Now you need to be a little faster, Stacy. You're doing great. There you go. Two green lights. And a little deeper, a little harder. Keep it up. And so she will practice until she gets three green lights. And this is how we do this in Simpson. With the same kind of a keep it up, nice job, a little faster, etc. And then when she's practiced, I can have her come back a month later and say, do you still remember how to do this? Let's see how you do this and see how well she does it. And this is how we maintain expertise. So that's one thing that I wanted to show you. Then the other thing, we just need to quickly plug in here, or is it plugged in? It's plugged in. It's in plugged in. You just have to turn it on. Is that um, laparoscopic trainer that I showed you. So there's a camera here. This is a camera. And you can see, if I wiggle it around, I can maneuver it so that I get a good view of my pegboard. You all see that? Yeah? Now this is my laparoscopic instrument, and I am not a surgeon, so I'm not very good at this. But now I have to look at the screen. It's very tempted to try to look down, but there's nothing to see down there. I look at the screen, and I'm going to try to grab this and move it, and move it over to another one, which is out of my field of vision, so now I have to move my camera. And this is how you learn hand-eye coordination, right? And if you practice on this, I'm not going to encourage you to then find a rat and try to take his gallbladder out of the <laughs> same kind of thing. But this is how you can practice those kind of skills. And then the last thing I'll show you, and Stacy will help me with this, is this mamma Natalie, which is a, essentially a fake uterus that she can strap on. And then she could wear a gown underneath it, over, over it so that people would actually not be able to see this at all. And as you can see, she can, with her hands, manipulate it so that the baby can come out. She would, of course, never do this standing up, but there is actually a baby yeah, hand there. there. There are handles in here for you to like open the cervix, and then you practice birthing with somebody. <laughs> right? So those are just a few of the toys that we brought from across the street for you to uh, see. Um, and uh, we'll take some questions first, if there are any questions, and then you can all feel free to come up here and play with our toys for a moment. But there's a question here. Um, well, this is a question about virtual reality. Yeah. Um, are you expanding or thinking of expanding the use of that so that almost you could do it to practice a surgery, let's say? Yeah. Seems like it has endless possibilities. It has endless possibilities. It's, and it's getting better and better to uh, practice all kinds of skills. Um, it's still, um, it takes quite a while to build the actual virtual reality, right? And if you think about surgery, for example, the number of surgeries that are out there, and then all the different configurations of uh, the human body and how um, that then needs to be, all, all that information needs to be fed into the simulator. So it's coming. Um, it's not yet to the for surgeries, for example, it's not yet uh, there to the degree that it's actually totally cost effective to do it on large scale, except for the more most basic surgeries. Um, not in our center, but at the um, uh, surgery center, which is across town, they are starting to do more and more virtual reality uh, surgical simulation. But for, for now, mostly with more basic surgeries. surgeries. It's coming, though, for sure. Uh, next door at the dental school, they have a very successful program involving students with real people. Yeah. Um, this is, I know on your chart you had dental, a very small participation in simulation, but I think that's because they do so much with real people. Dr. Lucy mentioned recently here that a goal is to get even arriving students involved, and you had on your charts patient history and simple tasking. So the question I have is, how do, Medical practice is different. It, it's not that easy to do what they do at the dental school when you have so many different departments. But just for example, if a student was entering third year, wanted to practice pediatrics eventually, and came to you and asked, could they get involved with you with real patients? Do you have a way to do that? Or 
is it better to do this with simulation right now? Yeah, and I just remembered actually I'm supposed to repeat your question, but your question is, has actually different parts to it. So let me repeat one part and address that, and that is about the dentistry school. I showed it's only a small portion, and you're absolutely right. What <coughs> I showed is the simulation that happens at our center, and then I mentioned an affiliated program. There is actually some there are some places where there's other simulations. So there's a surgical skill center that does um, very surgically or oriented simulation. Dentistry does a fair amount of stuff in their own um, uh, uh, school. And uh, physical therapy actually has now a really nice uh, lab space um, in the basement of the building next door to us um, that we also don't quite count in their numbers. So this is not totally everything that's going on in all of campus. There is more than that. I, this is the data that I collect, so I realize it's a little bit of a tunnel vision, but it's certainly um, becoming more and wi widespread. Most of the activities happen with us, but not everything. So that was one part of your question. Then your second question was, if I had, if there was a student who uh, says, I'm interested in pediatrics, are there opportunities for those students to come to see real patients with me, or is simulation a better uh, way to do that? Um, I think if it's about making a career decision, I would say come see the real thing because that gives you a feel of what my job really looks like, right? If it's about like, I want to get some skills ahead of the game, um, then I would say come to the simulation center. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank yeah. you. Other questions? All right, yes. I'm not sure about my question, so that's why I'm hesitant. Uh -huh. uh, but um, have you observed individuals who, in spite of repeated deliberate practice, somehow, in terms of certain areas, just don't get it mm -hmm. or never reach a certain level where they are competent. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of any example, but I uh, uh, surely in the human population of learners, there must be a percentage of them that no matter what you provide for them in simulation or with all this technology, there are those, well, I guess maybe there are some who, no matter how many hours they pour into it, they never develop eye-hand coordination. Mm -hmm. I am thinking in the community, there are individuals who practice, 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 but they'll never get how to speak a foreign language, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. It's actually a, a whole debate in, in the literature, and I think Malcolm Gladwell has written about this um, outside of the, the, the official published uh, journals and stuff like that. He sort of popularized these ideas of to what degree is this, is this talent and to what degree can you practice, right? And mm -hmm. I think it's still, I think the jury is still out, but, but the types of research that Eric Erickson has done around deliberate practice suggest that we overestimate talent and we underestimate practice. And so if you actually look at musicians that we, we think of as like these legendary jazz musicians and these legendary um, violinists and these legendary, right, if you actually look back at, if you read memoirs and, and, and biographies, you hear that they practice from from sun, sundown, from, from the morning till sundown. Um, they practiced a lot, right? Miles Davis is one of those legendary people who were like, oh, so talented, but he practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. He played almost all day long, all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think the literature suggests, the studies that have been done suggest that we're over um, appreciating talent, that we, we put a lot of in stake in that and that a lot of it is practice. Now, having said that, I know what you mean because I certainly have seen it. And there's things my, that I have myself that I've practiced, but I just am like, I'm not getting very good at. It's really a little difficult to totally tease that apart because one of the phenomena that you see a lot is when someone practices something and gets better at it, that creates an enormous motivator to practice more, right? And people get disincentivized from 
from a motivation perspective if they feel they don't make any progress. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they could not do it. It just means that somehow they've never made that step to then go to the next step and the next step. So that's, that's the limitation there. But I think it's true. There are people who are, um, don't have the same fine motor skills, right? There's people who have better or worse spatial memory. Um, there's certainly, there, there's, there is a, an end to that reasoning and there might be people um, that um, will reach a level and never get to the expertise. So how, how do we handle that with health professions education? That's why we've gotten so focused on competency-based assessment, where we don't just say, okay, you've been to medical school for four years, you're a doctor, you're good to go. Or you've been in nursing school for a year, you're a nurse now, you're good to go. But where we actually say, have you accomplished X, Y, and Z? And that will then drive remediation. And on a rare occasion, it will actually drive like, you know, this is not the right field for you. You need to think about something else. Very good question, interesting question. Okay, then I wanna, for those of you who want to, I wanna invite you up here to come play. Um, and then I thank you for coming.